Okay, all yours, Balaji. Okay, so welcome everybody for this uh, fourth maths talk in this uh, inauguration of the Kohli Center. It is my pleasure to introduce Chandrasekhar Khare. Shekhar Khare has made deep advances in the study of the relationship between Galois representations and modular forms, which relate to the study of integers, I mean, numbers, basically. He introduced ingenious and new ideas into the area to some long-standing questions. His first major advance in the field of Galois representations and number theory was by proving the level one Serre conjecture and later a, a, a proof of the full conjecture with Jean uh, Wintenberger. In 2007, he received the Fermat Prize. In 2010, the Infosys Prize. And in 2011, Chandrasekhar Khare and his collaborator Wintenberger received the Cole Prize in number theory for their work on settling this, the full Sayer conjecture. He's a professor at the University of California at Los Angeles. In 2012, he became a fellow of the Royal Society as well as a fellow of the American Mathematical Society. It gives me great pleasure to invite Professor Shekhar Khare to give his talk on modular forms, Galois representations, and the Ramanujan Prime 691. Thanks, thank you. So Shekhar, before, Shekhar, before you start, this is there a question. Yeah. So uh, if there are people have questions, would you prefer that they hold them or that they ask them? I, yeah, I think you ask them during the okay. lecture. Okay, so if you have a question, just politely interrupt. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so thanks so much, Bharaji and uh, Madhavan for the invitation to speak here. I've been to CMI, I think, perhaps only once in perhaps around 2008, and I really like the the building was quite interesting, different, full of light and air compared to kind of standard kind of uh, constructions. Uh, uh, so, and I think Seshadri was there, he, he was there in my lecture, it was a great honor to speak there, and it's, uh, it's nice to come, be back and speak, and I hope to visit sometime soon as well. Okay, so uh, let me share my screen. Okay, is it, is it visible? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, Ramanujan and the prime 691, right? There's this uh, number, I mean, uh, I think there's a famous number theorist who says that in the, any number theory lecture, there has to be a number. And often in my lectures, there's no number. So let me start with, with the number straight away, <laughs> 691. And it's a fairly interesting number. It's a fairly large prime, right? It's a prime which uh, occurs in Ramanujan's work in an important way. Uh, so what, what is more popularly associated with Ramanujan is the number 1729 because uh, famously there's the story of uh, Hardy visiting Ramanujan in a sanatorium uh, where he was recovering or, and uh, he was perhaps not in the best of spirits. So Hardy tried to cheer him up by saying, ah, I came by a taxi and it had a boring number, like 1729. And uh, then Ramanujan said that it is the smallest number which can be represented as the sum of two cubes in two different ways, 10 cubed plus nine cubed and 12 cubed plus one cubed. Right, and 1729, I think, is not prime. I did, I did a calculation, okay. <laughs> I think it's not prime, I think it's divisible by 13. Oh, okay, but there's another number which is, I think, more serious. This is perhaps part of recreational mathematics, but there's another number which is, or not really, but uh, but there's num another number which I think has theoretically has, has had more significance for number theory, which is the number 691, and which also occurs in Ramanujan's work. It occurred in his paper, a very influential paper. He wrote in 1916 on, called on some arithmetical functions. Right, and that Ramanujan, I mean, it's of course in the, it's in the Ramanujan style, so they're full, it's full of numbers and calculations. And uh, but there's this, there's these remarkable congruences and remarkable properties that he observed for the for his so-called what, what is now called the Ramanujan tau function, and which has influenced number theory in a big way. Right, starting with 1916 right to 1994 when Andrew Weil solved Fermat's last theorem, this now this, this these observations of Ramanujan sparked off a series of developments which kind of run diagonally across across the 20th century and really influenced the course of number theory. Uh, the, the, the type of number theory, which, uh, which was harnessed by Wiles in his uh, celebrated solution of Fermat's last theorem in, uh, in 1994. So, uh, I mean, for example, even, even, even my, my work with Jean-Pierre Matteau-Berger on Serre's conjecture, certainly it's kind of in that same tradition. The tradition is the tradition of studying congruences between modular forms. So let me, I'm gonna kind of try and talk about that. Okay, so this is, so the number 691 came up for Ramanujan when he studied in this 1916 paper, uh, congruences for his tau function. Uh, and somehow, I mean, the, that, that congruence, the 691 actually is a very interesting prime because it's not too large, like if it's some one prime with hundreds of digits, one doesn't really know that number. Right? So 691 is kind of a number you can comprehend with your mind. On the other hand, it's not too small. It's not like two, three, five, seven or something, right? So it's kind of a prime in the middle distance. It's not too big, not too small. So somehow it leaves an impression on one's mind. 
if one looks at it, if one uh, encounters it. And but it's still pretty large, right? So somehow, I mean, it was it was a prime which kind of made an impression on the mathematical community, and people continuously try to understand what 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 was what was the significance of these congruences Ramanujan discovered. Okay, so the setting, though I think Ramanujan in that paper doesn't even talk about modular forms. I mean, he, he just talks about tau. This uh, thinks about some sort of generating functions and uh, uh, isn't really thinking about modular forms. Uh, perhaps famously, I think maybe Ramanujan yeah, did not think much about complex analysis and so on. But uh, but 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 the actual background of uh, what he's doing is the is the theory of modular forms. Uh, and so we are going to start with. Uh, Looking at these space of modular forms, right? These are just certain holomorphic functions on the upper half plane, on the point carry upper half plane. So this is just the upper half of the complex plane where the imaginary part of Z, Z is bigger than zero, right? So these are functions on the upper half plane which have some unusual degree of symmetry. So first of all, they have a Fourier expansion. So they are invariant under translation, Z goes to Z plus one. And then they have a more subtle symmetry under Mobius inversion, right? F of minus one upon Z is equal to Z to the K. So the, these modular forms come with a weight with an integer weight, positive integer or non-negative integer uh, weight uh, k associated with them. So the weight k, the symmetry, though this is called the kind of the automorphic property of this modular form, that f under Mobius inversion uh, sends the function to z to the k times f of z. Right. So these are these are modular forms which are which were, which have been which was which have been studied for a long time, certainly by people like Jacobi and so on. Right. So. Uh, so, so, so in general, so the modular form of weight k and level one, which is the only level we are going to talk about, which is for the full congruent subgroup SL2Z, right? So these are two by two matrices with integer coefficients with determinant one, right? So these, uh, they act on the upper half plane by Mobius transformation, Z goes to AZ plus B upon CZ plus D. And the modular forms we're talking about have this symmetry property that they, under this Mobius transformation, they transform in this way, right? F of AZ plus B is equal to CZ plus D to the K times F of Z. And sitting inside uh, this space of modular forms are things which kind of decay at infinity, which tend to zero as you go up the uh, imaginary axis, right? So these are the space of cusp forms. So th th there's some vanishing properties, right? so typically a co-dimension one subspace of this space of modular form, right? So these are kind of finite dimensional complex vector spaces. And, uh, and the, 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 this is the context for, uh, this is the context why one would try in the present day invoke when thinking about Ramanujan's 1916 work, while he would not, I don't think he talked about modular forms at all in that paper. Okay, so uh, and these modular forms for small weights and levels don't exist, right? So for example, for uh, they vanish for uh, for odd integers, uh, for weight zero, they're probably just the constants. And uh, M2 is zero, the space of weight two for modular forms is zero, right? And uh, on the other hand, for uh, all weights k bigger than or equal to four, which are even, one can some, by some sort of averaging procedure, right? Because these are functions on the upper half plane with some symmetry. So one can typically to get objects which have certain symmetry, you can use some averaging procedure. So you can sort of do some averaging kind of procedure and come up with these, uh, one, I need to be able to minimize this. Okay. One can, uh, one can uh, write down a certain modular forms for each in their even integer k bigger than or equal to four, right? So these, these are the so-called Eisenstein series. We call them GK of Z. And they have this kind of Fourier expansion, which is very interesting because the constant term is the Riemann zeta fun function evaluated at one minus k up to a factor of two. And the, these other these other terms are uh, kind of much easier to comprehend, right? Some of these are uh, uh, these are elementary arithmetic functions, and these are actually these are elementary arithmetic functions were Ramanujan's main object of interest in that paper. So uh, so these were these sigma k minus one n. So these are just the sum of divisors of d to the exponent k minus one. Right, so it's anyway some kind of uh, holomorphic function where I'm writing down the Fourier series of it. And the constant term is pretty interesting. It's kind of mysterious in some ways because uh, it is the Riemann zeta function, which is of course a, a very important function for mathematics and for number theory and its special values at uh, negative uh, odd integers are pretty interesting. And uh, on the other hand, the non-constant Fourier coefficients are something uh, rather simple arithmetic arithmetical functions, just the sum of divisors to some exponent. Right, and uh, Ramanujan actually was interested in these uh, sigma k minus one type functions, and he was looking at convolved sums of these functions. And he kind of wanted to have some estimates or some explicit formulas for these, uh, for these functions. So at this point, I think I've minimized the thing so that I can't see any of the audience, but that's fine. Okay, if there are any questions, I'm, you'll have to tell me. Uh, okay, so, uh, so, so, okay, so this is the, these are some modular forms for each uh, integer k even bigger than or equal to four. 
right? Uh, and they have this shape. And Ramanujan, let me remind you, was interested in these functions, uh, convolving them and finding formula, the order of growth, et cetera. Okay, and then you kind of normalize this Eisenstein series by making the constant term one, right? That's why I'm for scaling it. And uh, E4 and E6, right? So these are the first uh, Eisenstein series. These are the Eisenstein series of the smallest weights of four and six, because for weight two, there's nothing. And they have this explicit uh, description, right? So they are, anyway, the formulas are uh, not terribly important for this lecture, but okay, here they are. And uh, so these functions in Ramanujan's notation, E4 and E6 were denoted by Q and R by Ramanujan, and that's often the notation used. For example, in Ser Seminar Burbaki talk from the early 70s, where he really kind of uh, got the subject going again by introducing in the work of Ser and Sunakandaya some beautiful modern techniques to understand all this stuff Ramanujan was doing. Uh, he, uh, I mean, he calls them Q and R, right? So this goes back to Ramanujan. And now the space of modular forms uh, K, uh, MK for K beginning equal to four. So there's this space of cusp forms, which is mysterious, right? It's difficult to write down just, uh, by, it's difficult to write down a cusp form, but it, either they're, 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 the Eisenstein series are perhaps easier to write down. And so somehow they form a complement for the space of cusp forms. Right, any questions so far? Let me try and see more of the audience. So let me, uh, I don't know what to do here. Hmm. All right. Uh, yeah. Any questions so far? All right. So uh, okay. So now now we can consider, consider the entire, entire algebra of modular forms. You can look at the direct sum of, uh, of weight mo modular forms of level one and weight k for all k, even k becomes equal to zero, right? And uh, so this actually turns out to be a polynomial algebra, and these two things Ramanujan uh, called Q and R, the weight four and weight six Eisenstein series. And uh, okay, so you can kind of and and these formulas kind of these e the expressions for the twelfth Eisenstein series in terms of uh, in terms of Q and R and so on, they show up, for example, in Ramanujan's, I think, uh, paper. Uh, okay, and so, so now the first time there is a cusp form, the cusp forms are, I mean, the first, so Eisenstein series ex start existing from weight bigger than equal to four, even, even weight bigger than equal to four. But the first time there's a cusp form is actually for, for weight 12, right? So there's no cusp form of weight two, four, six, eight, ten. And uh, for 12, there's a cusp form, and then there's this famous uh, function, it's uh, maybe, studied of course by Jacobi and various people it has it has a uh, kind of connection with the theory of elliptic curves so it's the discriminant function uh, or called the delta function right I mean uh, and uh, so this delta function is the first time you have a cusp form uh, and uh, it's of the cusp form of the smallest weight so weight 12 right and the corresponding space of cusp forms is one dimensional and this then the coefficients of this cusp form are the, called the Ramanujan tau function right so this Ramanujan delta function uh, okay or uh, is defined by, uh, is, is this, I mean, it's the first cusp form, it's the cusp form of A12, the unique cusp form of the scaling, and then you normalize it so that, uh, so that because it's a cusp form, there's no constant term, and you normalize it so that uh, the, 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 the first, the, the coefficient of Q is, is one, right? So somehow this is this function, which is uh, uh, given by this product expansion, which again was known to, I think, Jacobi, and uh, it was certainly known in the 19th century. And, uh, and on the other hand, it has this Fourier expansion. Right, so it has this Fourier expansion. There is summation of tau and q n, and these were the functions. These are these arithmetical functions tau n, which Ramanujan studied. For him, they actually showed up as error terms when he was trying to look at looking at, looking at convolved sums of these uh, simple arithmetic functions, which are given by uh, sums of divisor functions of a number n to various powers. Right, so it showed up showed up as an error term, and he wanted to somehow say bound the error term. Right, so that was one of the conjectures he made: bounding the size, the Archimedean size, bounding the size of tau n. Right, so, so, this, so this is the Ramanujan tau function, and uh, this is what he kind of uh, studied in that paper. Right? So if, for example, if you look at his paper, uh, there's a table of the first 30 values of tau n. And just staring at these, I'm sure he may, must have computed more, and maybe published only 30 of them. Uh, just staring at them, he came up with these remarkable conjecture, right? somehow uh, which uh, set the subject off. Right? People then kind of were inspired by this paper for decades. OK. Oh, the, so the oh, uh, yeah. Shekhar, you keep mentioning uh, convolution. So I guess the tau ones would be convolutions of the co coefficients of Q and R, right? I mean, triple convolution. I think there, there, is, there is convolved sums where you fix the sigma K and sigma K prime, right? For K and fix K and K prime. Then you sum over like something from D, uh, R equal to 1 to N of sigma K N minus sigma uh, K prime n minus r or something like that. Yeah, so, so triple convolutions of coefficients of q and double convolutions of uh, coefficients of r. Is that uh, the correct intuition? I mean, because uh, or, or yeah, in some sense, what you're doing is multiplying two Eisenstein series up, 
right? And that, that yeah. resulting object will not be an Eisenstein series. I mean, it, there, will, there will be some, it will be an Eisenstein series of that weight plus some cusp form. Now, okay. sometimes when the cusp form is zero because the weight is small, he gets exact formulas for these convolved sums. Okay. The first time he gets something which is not an exact formula is in weight 12, when, when you have to deal with this Ramanujan, when this delta function. Okay. And somehow, uh, I mean, yeah, he wants to evaluate these as explicitly as he can, but there's an error term coming from the uh, coefficients of the cusp form. Okay. And, yeah. But actually, so as somehow, I mean, perhaps the more, more than coming with, I think what's turned out to be important is the function tower, right, rather than this thing he was actually doing. But uh, for him, it came up as an error term. And uh, so these are, uh, so okay, any questions about this tau function? So okay, you can just think about this. You can forget about modular forms as Ramanujan perhaps did. The, 17, you, the 1729 uh, comes because of his knowledge about 1728. Okay, that, 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 I think, okay, maybe that's a coincidence, I think, yeah. 1720, yeah. The fact that this is 1728, yeah. Uh, but the 691 is yet to come. Okay, so uh, 691 comes up in some very uh, sort of indirect way, right? I mean, so we'll see it later. So, uh, so he, so Ramanujan looked at the first 30 values of tau n, and then came up with these remarkable conjectures, right? Or perhaps, I'm sure he computed more, perhaps. Uh, but uh, at least in that table, I think in that paper, I think the only tau n is computed for n up to 30. I think if I, I haven't looked at this paper very recently, but that's my memory. Okay, so so now he he, he uh, conjectured that tau had this multiplic multiplicative property, right? That tau m n for m n and co prime. So it's not completely multiplicative, but for at least for m n co prime, you have tau it multiplies out. Right, and then the, for on the other hand, when it's when M and N are not co-prime, then it's not multiplicative. So it's tau p to the n plus one for a prime p, is the is tau p n times tau p, which is kind of looks multiplicative. But then there's a correction term, minus p to the eleven times tau to the p n minus one. Right. So these are these are two conjectures he made, and on the other hand, then he came up with this remarkable also conjecture that tau p is less than or equal to two times p to the five point five. Right, so somehow this is a very strange number to come up with, right? Because someone one would think, okay, p to the six or p to the seven or something, but he came up with this kind of half integer that this should that, that they should value this that tau p should satisfy the bound, uh, this bound, right? So this this is nowadays called the Ramanujan conjecture, which has now become a prototype for conjecture which pervades math number theory, automorphic forms, the theory of automorphic forms. There's this very vast conjecture called the, the a set of conjectures called the Ramanujan conjectures, which uh, give you bounds for uh, some. Things coming from automorphic forms, the Satake parameters, or something related to Fourier coefficients of modular forms. Okay, so there were these three conjectures he made. Uh, so in fact, these, these two conjectures, the first two conjectures were almost proved immediately by a model. I think both of them were perhaps in Cambridge. Uh, so anyway, so uh, so Ramanujan, this conjecture was proved very rapidly by model, and he introduced right. So somehow, in though Ramanujan would perhaps not think, think of categorification, right? But now to use this fashionable word of categorification, I mean, the way Ramanujan's conjectures and work has influenced mathematics is by always giving higher meaning to these tau n, right? For him, they were these functions, okay, defined by this formula. But uh, each time you, some people have proved significant things about tau n is, is by giving some interpretation of uh, tau n in terms of some sort of, yeah, giving them greater meaning. So for example, uh, the model, if, uh, proved Ramanujan's first two conjectures, right, which were these properties, not yeah, these are properties he observed, the multiplicative properties he observed of the Raman of the tau function, by realizing these tau n's as eigenvalues of heck of what are, what he some operators he introduced, which were later called Hecke operators, though they were first introduced by model in this particular context, and uh, so somehow because these operators had some structural meaning. Somehow, uh, so he introduced these operators, t sub m, right? T, t, it indexed by t, t sub uh, various integers. So the, the operators he introduced, they acted on the space of modular forms, preserving the space of cusp forms. And these operators, uh, they were kind of, uh, they, they, they satisfied these relations which Ramanujan had conjectured for his tau n, right? So t, m, n, I mean, these two relations are in exact parallel with what Ramanujan had conjectured for his tau function. And it turns out, that the delta function is an eigenform for these Hecke operators, and the eigenvalues of T n are tau is tau n, right? So somehow the, the so the way the Ramanujan's multiplicative theory conjectures for the tau n were proved was by realizing them as eigenvalues of operators acting upon the space of modular forms or cusp forms, right? Uh, so uh, so for example, the Eisenstein series, are, which I wrote down which are rather explicit, right? Somehow Eisenstein series have this structure that the constant term is very interesting. It's from some zeta value, but the other non-constant terms are pretty explicit, uh, simple arithmetic functions. Though those were the functions Ramanujan was interested in. Uh, and their eigenvalues for this Hecke operators 
which was first actually introduced by model, uh, are, are these arithmetical functions, sigma k minus one n, right? Where sigma k minus one n is the sum of divisors of n to the k minus first power, right? Any questions at this point? Okay, so the first two conjectures of Ramanujan, or what, what I call it. Yeah, so one, sorry, one question. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, one question. So these, uh, uh, so these SKs were your uh, cusp objects, or SKs were your yeah. what? Yeah, cusp. SK. So they happen to be eigen uh, eigen vectors for these things. Is that the way I should one should understand it? So these first of all, these, yes. I mean, the space SK is preserved by the Hecke operators. It acts upon MK okay. but preserves the subspace, and this Hecke, Hecke action can be diagonalized because it's there's okay. some self okay. properties. And in the case of the delta function, it's a it's a one-dimensional space. So that delta is supposed to be an eigenvector for all okay, these operators. Okay, okay. So these are commuting, yeah, I should have said these are commuting families of operators which are self-adjoint and then by, by basic okay. linear and algebra, they can be diagonalized. And delta function is an eigenform, as an eigenvector, it's called, what is called an eigenform for these operators. Okay. And the eigen okay. the, the Fourier the eigenvalues. Uh, are exactly the Fourier coefficient. So the Tn, the eigenvalue for Tn acting upon delta is tau n, the nth Fourier coefficient. Okay. okay. So, that was, that's, yeah. so there was this kind of beautiful story uh, which my model started, right? I mean, and if you want, I mean, okay. It's, uh, so the, for those of you who've seen it, uh, okay, but let me just uh, explicitly, uh, this model for the way this thing acts upon Hecke operate upon, um, upon uh, modular forms is given by this uh, kind of uh, formula. Where the lth Hecke operator for L prime, especially, is given by this formula, right? Where we get this explicit kind of formula on the effect on Fourier expansion. But the point about these uh, TLs, right, is that, uh, that they have a meaning. They have, they have some more different kind of meaning. And hence, it's easier to prove these properties of multiplicity. There's some kind of tool uh, handle you have to. If you just look at this formula, also, it's pretty mysterious. I don't think you can prove uh, these multi multiplicative properties just looking at this formula. But on the other hand, they basically represent some action of symmetry. There's some averaging kind of, uh, they have some averaging kind of, uh, def they have a definition using averaging, which and yeah, which uh, allows you to prove these uh, properties for these Hecke operators and hence for the eigenvalues. Okay, so. so is that potential TL acting on F? Does that. Uh... Yeah, this is this is this is this formula is giving the act, action of TL on F, where F is a some cusp form, for example. Okay. okay. And yeah. uh, F starts off life as summation a n q n, and then this is its effect when you when you apply TL to it. Yeah. Again, it's just a formula, but actually it's kind of yeah, it has it has a more structural meaning, which is what is used to prove the relations on TL. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, so, excuse me. Uh, can I ask a question? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, so when you showed these relations for the Hecke operators, uh, you had the same p to the eleven there. Is is yeah. it not the eleven was related to the fact that it was a weight twelve form, right? Uh, yes, it is. It. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sorry. yeah. Uh, uh, so, but in the next slide, when you wrote down the Hecke, the Hecke operators are defined on a general uh, k. Yeah. Uh, so and then, no, no, in the previous, uh, in the previous slide when oh, you wrote okay, okay. the, the so second the, the, relation there at the second relation t p to the n plus one that's only when it acts on the weight 12 forms is it correct yeah, right. that's a typo yeah that 11 should actually be k minus one thanks Maggie. okay <laughs> yeah sorry yeah, that's a typo yeah. i'm kind of There's only a general relation like that uh, yes okay good yeah. yeah so somehow there's a correction term and that correction term kind of comes is related to the weight also yeah Okay. P to the 11 or P to the K minus one is some sort of central action. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. So this Delta turns out to be an eigenfunction for these uh, Hecke operators, right? And, uh, and, and, okay. and these Hecke operators have of course played a very, very influential role in the theory of modular forms and in number theory, I think. Uh, uh, the, 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 main, the interesting thing about cusp forms, the space of cusp forms is it's just a finite dimensional complex vector space, right? But what makes it interesting? Is that there's this interesting family of operators and the eigenforms of these operators are very they started they play a very starring role in mathematics in number theory. So uh, okay, so delta function is the first star, right, which appeared in the in the in the, on the horizon, but then then of course it has there are several others. Okay, so now now actually, so Ramanujan, I think in this paper itself remarked that these exotic properties of the of the tau function is I mean they're relatively kind of strange, right? These multi especially tau p to the n plus one, some kind of strange recursion formula. 
But actually, you can kind of think of them more systematically, or kind of more kind of uh, in a nicer way by looking at the Dirichlet L series associated with delta. Right. So starting with this delta, which is summation tau and q to the n, where q is e raised for a few pi i z, you can do some kind of Mellon transform. Or anyway, you can just formally look at look at the corresponding Dirichlet series, right, which is tau n upon n to the s. And then what, what Ramanujan observed is that whatever he was saying about these tau n's actually can be expressed by saying that this L function L delta s uh, has an Euler product expansion, right? So in the sense L delta s can be written as a product over primes p of these kind of sim much simpler kind of uh, kind of Euler factors at p, right? Which have this shape: one minus tau p to the p minus s plus p to the eleven minus s. Again, that eleven coming from the weight twelve. It's twelve minus one. Right, so you observe that this uh, that this this is a better way of thinking about these uh, properties of tau of, of tau m tau especially what happens at the prime powers, right? And then, in fact, Hecker Hecker also later proved that uh, uh, like I'm not sure if it's later. I'm, I'm not my history may not be perfect. Okay, so uh, you 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 complete this L function by uh, putting in some factor at infinity called the gamma function, right? So two pi minus s to the gamma times gamma s times this L delta s, and this has a a functional equation that L lambda 12 minus S is equal to lambda S, right? And this function, this L, this function is basically a direct consequence of this Mobius inversion formula that delta minus one upon Z is equal to Z to the 12 times delta Z, right? So, uh, so if you multiply, it's a simple exercise to show that these multiplicative properties, at least formally, if you just expand everything out, the these properties of uh, that Ramanujan observed about tau, the multiplicative properties are basically the fact that L delta S has this Euler product expansion, right? So this is the first time in history, I think, uh, that, uh, that, that you're writing down some L function and you have an Euler product expansion in some sense, which has degree bigger than one, right? So some of the precedent for this was, which is what I hope I say next slide, okay, not yet. Okay, so the third property, uh, which Ramanujan conjectured actually took many years. It took, I think, six decades or something, or maybe five, six decades to prove, right? The third property that tau P is less than or equal to two times P to the 5.5, uh, the, the, so model proved uh, Ramanujan's multiplicative properties overnight, right? Well, I don't know, within a few months or within a year. While um, this property, this Ramanujan conjecture, was proved uh, as a result of work of Delhi, in for which he won the Fields Medal. So as a as a result of his proof of the way conjectures and some earlier construction of again this reification of tau and interpreting as interpreting it as some sort of as we'll see, giving it some Galois theoretic interpretation. So it took many decades to prove this. Right, so the, the, the much easier bound. So the trivial bound, or maybe, I don't know. What, uh, the trivial bound is that the tau p is roughly of the order of p to the six. That's very easy to prove from basic principles in complex analysis. I think Ramanujan himself had observed that tau p has some, I, exact, I, don't, know, I don't know the exponent he got, maybe p to the seven or something. But what, if you just depart from 5.5 a little bit, like we go to six, it's easy to prove Ramanujan's weakened version of Ramanujan's conjecture. So Ramanujan has the insight that there are actually this number distance between six and 5.5, which is just 0. 0.5, is actually a distance worthy worth traveling. And it took decades to travel that distance, right? To shrink from six to 5.5. Okay, any questions at this point? Okay. So, okay, so, I, uh, so, okay. Uh, so Hardy was, uh, Hardy was slightly skeptical about this uh, sharp importance of the sharpening that Ramanujan had conjectured. So he, for example, said, uh, we seem to have drifted into one of the backwaters of mathematics, right? But I, I think Hardy qualified this by saying that maybe as Ramanujan has thought about it, maybe, maybe it is interesting. So he said that the prime might have some features which made it not unworthy of Ramanujan's attention. Right, and this conjecture has turned out to be one of the master conjectures in number theory, right? People think about it all the time in various contexts. This is just the first of the contexts in which this type of conjecture shows up. Right, so again, Ramanujan had some remarkable kind of you know, intuition or sense of what is important, right, and what is worth thinking about. Uh, okay, right. I mean, so again, I mean, so this, this, uh, this, uh, the delta function. Okay, maybe I've, uh, the L series is the first time that kind of uh, Euler. You had an L L function which had an Euler product expansion, and the Euler product expansion was a degree bigger than one. Now, how do what do I mean? What do I mean by degree? Now associated to the Ramanujan delta function, you can define the speed Hecker polynomial, right? Which is the H which I defined, uh, one minus tau p x plus p to the eleven times x squared. Uh, and when evaluated x to the p minus s, you give you basically get the Euler factor at p. So right, so this is what I mean. That this is a degree two Euler factor, uh, right? And the Ramanujan conjecture on Archimedean on the size of tau p can just be said can be. Uh, Reformulated as saying that the discriminant of this polynomial, this quadratic polynomial, is negative, right? Maybe it's, or at least less than or equal to zero. 
I don't think zero occurs. Okay, but uh, okay. So what I want to point out is that again, Ramanujan was very prophetic in the sense that paper was very important. For the first time the, uh, on Euler product expansion of degree bigger than two, there was a precedent for this, as I say in my next slide. Right, the Riemann zeta function, of course, has a well uh, been known to have an Euler product expansion for a long time, but somehow it's of degree one, right? And it the zeta s, which is okay, which is a priori first defined as summation one upon n to the s, right? Some sort of harmonic series. Uh, that had a Euler product expansion, perhaps observed first by Euler, right? The, the series converges for real part of s bigger than one and turned out to have a, later on it was proven to have a continuation to the complex plane outside s equal to one with a simple pole at s equal to one. And this had a Euler product expansion, right? So somehow this is a degree one Euler product expansion because you're just looking at the polynomial one minus x and evaluating x at p to the minus s. Well, Ramanujan's uh, Euler factor is one minus tau px plus p, there's, a, there's an x squared term, right? So there's, a, there's the first time a, degree bigger than one the Riemann zeta function, uh, L function had been observed. Uh, there was a cognate of this Riemann zeta function defined by Dirichlet in his proof of, uh, he inv invented this brilliant L function in his proof of the infinitude of primes in arithmetic progression, which is these kind of can be thought of in modular forms of for GL1, right? So you're looking at these Dirichlet characters uh, of conductor dividing N, Z mod NZ cross to C cross to C star, uh, and you can define this oil Dirichlet L function, right? And uh, again, this is again a uh, this has an Euler product expansion, but of, again of degree one, right? But this time the Euler the the quadrat the polynomial does depend upon p, right? It's one minus chi p x, um, yeah. And they play a kind of so this is a great proof of Dirichlet of primes of infinitude. Uh, infinite of primes and arithmetic progression. Okay, so again, so this is the first, I mean, Ramanujan's prophetic 1916 paper for the first time wrote down an L function of degree bigger than, with an Euler product expansion of degree bigger than one. And that somehow explained uh, Ramanujan's multiplicative properties for his tau function, which were also explained by, by which were rather proved by realizing them as eigenvalues for Hecke operators, right? Which were actually introduced by Mod X. Okay, so maybe this is, uh, Okay, now the next kind of theme in Ramanujan's 1916 paper was some congruences he observed, right? And one of the, the remarkable congruences he observed was that tau n is congruent to sigma 11n mod 691, right? For example, if you specialize n to a prime p, this is just saying that tau p is equal to one plus p to the 11 mod 691, right? Because tau n is not a simple function. It's not some sums of divisors function. It's a pretty complicated function. It's where it's, uh, you cannot find explicit formulas for it, except, except the way it's defined, right? Uh, so, but on the other hand, what he observed, what Ramanujan observed was that modulo sum primes and the largest prime was 691, you, the sum of the tau n mod 691 simplifies, right? It's kind of an elementary function. It's, uh, for example, here it is just uh, summation, sigma 11n. Right, so somehow this was something, some degeneration or whatever, some, some, some specific thing, some special thing which happened when you reduce this numbers, these numbers mod 691, right? So 691, uh, the significance of 691 actually is, uh, also, I mean, one reason why this, this congruence holds is because 691 divides the numerator of the 12th Bernoulli number, right? So somehow, I mean, that was the, and it turns out the constant term of the 12th Eisenstein series actually has something to do with B12 and, uh, in some sense, this is all related to the fact that uh, the Eisenstein series mod 691 looks like a cusp form. In any case, so the, the, the but this uh, just numerically, this is the congruency observed, right? So somehow this uh, this set off now uh, this set off another journey, right? Which was to investigate why such a congruence exists. Then people over the years tried, five, found more and more congruences, right? But they were always with respect to much smaller primes. So the primes for which, uh, especially I think perhaps this was a tradition in England, perhaps and in India. I think Bamba and also people like that also found some congruences. So uh, the people found various congruences for tau n. I mean, maybe getting the name wrong, but anyway, these were pursued in, in England and India and uh, where people found uh, congruences modulo various primes, but none as large as 691. So two, three, five, seven, right? People found congruences modulo various primes, but 691 was the largest one. Uh, okay. But I'll, I'll skip the proof. Okay, the proof is actually not that difficult to prove this congruence. So unlike Ramanujan's other conjecture, this is an easier kind of uh, thing. I, I don't think this was a conjecture. Perhaps Ramanujan proved this, this congruence. Okay, so there were other similar congruences found for two, three, five, seven, twenty-three, and six ninety-one. So this is a famous list of primes. These are the so-called exceptional primes for the Ramanujan delta function, uh, and. Uh, yeah, so there, there were various primes found modulo, but on the other hand, two, three, five, seven is not so remarkable that there are congruences just because I mean, two, three, five, seven is very small. Some of most of these congruences can just be explained because two, three, five, seven are just small numbers, 
right? 23 has a somewhat different nature. But all these congruences were of the form that when you read tau n modulo one of these L's, exceptional L's, somehow tau n simplified to be some elementary function in terms of n, elementary arithmetic function. Uh, now I'm going to skip this for lack of time. There is a question in the chat, actually. Maybe you want to. Yeah. Okay, should I look so at the chat one, one second? Qu the qu yeah, one minute. Huh? The question is, is that some, I don't know what, Later, it just came. Is that a consequence of the functional equation that the tau function satisfies? Why does the fact that p to the 11 occurs? Yeah, yeah that weight that weight occurring is uh, that p, but that the fact that tau p is congruent to 1 plus p to the 11 has is because of the fact that uh, tau is of weight 12. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the, most of the congruences had the similar nature, 2, 3, 5, 7, and 6, 91. In 23, it was, it was slightly, ex, uh, uh, slightly exceptional. But still, there was some sort of simplification of uh, tau p mod 23. Okay, so now the explanation for these congruences actually come, came much later. So these congruences were found in the 1930s, 40s, 50s. I, I, don't, I don't know the exact history. But they were found uh, over, a, over a period of time. But the actual structural explanation, why do, why do these congruences exist? And why had people not found any other congruences, modulo any other primes, was explained by some very beautiful work by, uh, by Peter Sunet and uh, Jean-Pierre Serre uh, uh, in the late 1960s and uh, early 70s, perhaps. So uh, there, there are these famous seminars of uh, Serre uh, from 1967 and uh, in the seminar Delange, Pissot Poitou or something, and then also a Bourbaki follow-up talk by, by Serre, where he kind of explained, where he set out to uh, find, to explain these congruences of Ramanujan. Why do they exist and why are there no congruences modulo other prime there, right? So of course, you want to formulate this more precisely is uh, take some work. But now, so now again, so now this is the next step of categorification, right? So uh, you, you now try to interpret uh, these tau functions, uh, the values of tau, especially at primes p, uh, not only in terms of eigenvalues of the Hecke operators, but now you give them a higher meaning in terms of traces of Frobenius in certain Galois representations, right? So now this is a much kind of perhaps more higher level of abstraction, perhaps, but uh, but but it explains some very concretely things about number, right? Tau n, properties of tau, right? So otherwise, what is the point of abstraction if one can't explain phenomena which existed before the abstraction, right? So this this piece of abstraction certainly has justifies itself by really giving a very satisfying explanation of why Ramanujan's congruences existed and why no no others were ever discovered, and hence and actually Sayer and Sunil have proved. That for primes L not equal to 2, 3, 5, 7, 23, 6, 91, one cannot, one can, one can show that there are no other, con there, there cannot be simple congruences, right? So, okay, so in this, in this paper of uh, Serre in 1967, I think, uh, they, Serre, first of all, uh, gave, tried to give a meaning to these uh, tau function uh, by saying that they should actually be explained as the traces of Frobenius in some elliptic Galois representation, right? So now perhaps I'm going to maybe, uh, yeah. Uh, so he constructed a certain Galois representation, right? So the GQ is this absolute Galois group of Q, right? So you look at Q, look at its algebraic closure, and look at the group of symmetries of this algebraic closure, right? Look at all the field automorphisms of Q bar. So somehow this is GQ in some ways, this is again the master group in number theory as uh, one just, it knows everything about number theory. We just have to prevail upon it to tell you to vary a quote of harder, right? So it's kind of a very important group. And so what, what, what Serre said, uh, conjectured in this 19, I think it's 67 paper, that there should exist a representation of this absolute Galois group of Q, which is a humongous group, very mysterious. One doesn't know much about it, right? It's a, certainly an infinite group. Uh, so in many cases, uh, for example, when it's very hard to write down any element of this group, right? Of course, the identity of a L group, <laughs> identity element always exists. And the only other element one can kind of write down is the complex conjugation, right? By embedding Q bar inside C and looking at Z goes to Z bar and restricting it. So in fact, these are the two only, only two elements of finite order of this group up to conjugation. Uh, anyway, so it's a mysterious group, but on the other hand, you can, uh, so Sayer said, okay, somehow the explanation for these congruences of Ramanujan lies in Galois theory, right? So he said that you, you should, that they, he conjectured there exists a represent, elliptic representation associated to delta, right? So GL to ZL, ZL is just the inverse limit of Z mod L to the N. So these are the sort of elliptic numbers introduced by Hensel. Uh, and uh, yeah, so there's so, so, so a representation of GQ into GL to ZL, and it's and uh, which is unramified. Now I'm going to use some terminology. It's unramified outside L, right? So there's this prime L, and it's unramified outside L. And the connection of this representation to the delta function is 
that's in, in, within this representation, there are certain marked conjugacy classes, right? You convert primes, the Frobenius kind of element converts a prime P into an element or a conjugacy class of the Galois group, right? So, uh, so within this GQ are certain marked conjugacy classes called Frobenius at P and, and the connection of the delta function to this Galois representation is if you look at the characteristic polynomial of rho delta of Frobenius at P for all primes P not L, right? Is, is exactly given by this degree two Euler factor, this degree two polynomial coming from the delta. Right, of course, for those of you who have not seen this, there's a lot, this, this is a lot to swallow in a slide, but maybe the takeaway is that you have some kind of, you interpret tau, model interpreted tau, tau p as eigenvectors for Hecke operators, eigenvalues for certain Hecke operators, for certain operators. Now, Ser is proposing a higher level explanation by interpreting these as traces and representations. Right, in traces in some sort of non abelian, some GL2 type representation. Right, so uh, the, of course, there was a precedent for Serre to make this conjecture. There were already known cases of this elladic representations associated to modular forms, not for delta, but for weight two, due to some amazing work of Eichler and Shimura in the 1950s. Right, right. but so the, some of this was some higher weight kind of generalization of something which was known in weight two. Okay, any questions about this? No, this is, of course, uh, yeah. So, uh, so such representations, as I say, had been, but they, were, they didn't come out of the blue, right? In the sense, there wasn't sort of, they, they, they existed some sort of prototype of these representations in weight two. Okay, let me not go into much detail about this. Uh, so now, so now, the, so the next the level of categorification is, as I said, in, interpret tau p, you know, in a more sophisticated way as traces of Frobenius in elladic Galois representations, right? And, okay, so that, let me skip this slide and then, and the Delin, actually Delin rapidly proved this conjecture of uh, Serre, uh, maybe within a year or two, I don't know, uh, using Grothendieck's theory of ethyl cohomology, out in Grothendieck's theory of ethyl cohomology, uh, uh, Delin proved this conjecture, right? He actually proved the existence of the Galois representation, but Serre and Sunit and I actually were happy to just conjecture the existence and assume the existence, uh, assume the existence and then go on to study properties of this Galois representation, right? So you know, Delin did prove this, but uh, Sayer and Sunandai just went ahead and studied this Galois representation. What, what, kind of, uh, what kind of representation is it, if it exists? But Delin, of course, proved it exists. And that's how uh, Delin actually proved Ramanujan's uh, conjecture about his bounds on tau p. Where this is the interpretation which led to Delin's proof of Ramanujan's conjecture about size of tau p by interpreting them as uh, eigenvalues of, as traces of Frobenius and then bounding the traces of and where they come from in terms of some algebraic geometry and then proving the way conjecture, right? So there was this very long story so it started in 1916 and ended with uh, Delin's proof of the way conjectures, which then proved Ramanujan's conjecture, this particular conjecture. Yeah, okay. Okay, so this uh, Sarah in his article, okay, so as I said, Sarah and Sarah, I, I mean, again, uh, Sarah and Sunandai never published a joint paper, right? But so somehow, but I think this is joint work, which was then summarized in different papers of Sayer and Sunit and Dyer. And Sunit and Dyer, in fact, in one of his articles in Antwerp says that this is joint work and who did what is left to the reader as an exercise in stylistic analysis, right? So some of them never published a paper and it was all joint work, which was written up separately by them, I think, okay. Uh, okay, so Sayer in his article in this Delange Piso Poitou 1967 seminar, right? Conjectured this Galois representation and, uh, and made some remarks about how that would like explain some of these congruences of Ramanujan. But, and uh, then Rash Swinit and Dyer actually kind of just, okay, assumed that Galois representations existed. And actually the, this work of Swinit and Dyer convinced Sayer that well, his conjecture about the existence of Galois representations actually should be correct. Because somehow one is saying that uh, if, one is, if, one, if one is interpreting tau p, the trace of Frobenius and some Galois representation, it, it is putting some symmetry on, it is putting some structure on these Galois, rep, on these numbers, tau p's, right? And so it is still, it's, uh, to, to be convinced that this structure is something which actually happens, one needed some verification. So one of the things Sunit and I explained was that these two adic congruences, which people had discovered, could be explained by showing that the two adic Galois representation conjectured by Ser and proved by Delin, uh, the image of this Galois representation had a particular shape, right? It was an index three times two to the 25 subgroup of GL to Z2. And somehow it explains some exotic congruence or some rather congruence of lemma modulus some very high power of two, right? Two to the 11. Anyway, so somehow uh, th there was all this work going on, right? People uh, could say conjecture the existence, uh, Sunit and, and Ser started studying the image of these images of these Galois representations. And they realized that the, that the key to explaining Ramanujan's congruences, why they existed modulus some primes and not others, was basically 
proving properties of the images of these Galois representations. Somehow one wants, one wants to somehow analyze what the image of these Galois representations is, right? And of course, then this started a long series of works by Ser in the 1970s, which is a famous series of works about studying images of elliptic representations coming from motifs, right? For example, elliptic curves. There's a very famous paper of his uh, from the 1970s. Okay. So for example, now the, the congruence of Ramanujan is really explained by the 691 congruence is equivalent to the fact that when you look at this 691 adic representation, now you can specialize the prime L in the Sayers conjectures, right? The elliptic representation, you can specialize it to L equal to 691. And then you look at this elliptic representation, 691 so what does the, representation. Why does the image have to do with uh, whether it's ramified or not? Is that is that the connection? Yeah, I mean, somehow, I'm going to come to that. The, the image somehow, uh, the, 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 especially the mod L image, not the elliptic image, the mod L image, if it kind of simplifies, because the model image is a, represent, is a representation from GQ, the absolute Galois group of Q, into GL to Z mod L, right, FL. So whether the image is, when the image degenerates, when it becomes small, typically one would expect the image should be large. It should contain SL2 FL. But when the image becomes small, that explains Ramanujan's congruence. So somehow the smallness of the model image of the Galois representation Sarah had conjectured to exist explained Ramanujan's congruence. So that was the great, great, great grand idea of Sarah and Sarandaya. And of course, but the entire thing is how do you control the images? They developed a very, very beautiful ge geometric theory of model, modular forms to come up to study these images. Right, so for example, just uh, the congruence mod 691 of Ramanujan can be explained by saying that actually the mod 691 thing, the mod 691 representation coming from Ramanujan's delta function uh, is reducible, right? So typically these model images would be irreducible, but in mod L, in mod 691, this image is reducible. And in some sense, it is given exactly by something like this, one star zero, and the, this is some, character chi 691 to the 11th power. This is the so-called so mod 691 cyclotomic character, which is observing the action of Galois on 691st roots of unity, right? So somehow it's some, it's some specific representation reducible, but the main thing is that it's reducible. And that explains the extra congruence, the congruence Ramanujan found, right? So, okay, I'm gonna skip this slide. I'm running out of time. Uh, right, so somehow, somehow, uh, uh, Swinnerton, Dye, and Serre proved that the image rho delta L, right? This rho delta has, has large image, this elliptic representation, which they didn't even know existed, but they, they were fine with it. They just said, okay, let, let's assume it exists. And because somehow where it comes from does matter in various finer aspects, but somehow you don't know, you don't need to know Delian's construction to prove their theorems, right? You just axiomatically assume that this representation exists, and then you just go ahead and study what the image could can be. So they, they showed that this, this elliptic representation, if it, all, if it at all existed, had large image, right? For especially for, for L not outside this except, exceptional set of primes. Okay, so they proved that this uh, image was large. So the largeness being uh, quantified by saying that the image contains the SL2, the two by two elliptic matrices of determinant one, right? The determinant somehow is also known. So the main thing is to know whether it contains SL2 ZL or not. Right, and they somehow showed for L now outside this exceptional set, the image contains the is big, right? In the sense it contains SL to ZL. And that somehow explained why there were no congruences uh, mod L for L not in the exceptional set, right? Because somehow that having simple congruences for tau and mod L would contradict the fact that the mod L image uh, of the tau function of the delta function of this rho delta L is large. Of course, it's a bit vague. I mean, to, to make all this precise, perhaps, uh, especially when I'm seeing this for the first time, it requires some sort of, it'll require more time, which I don't have. Okay, but I just wanted to explain to you, I just wanted to point out this fact that the Ramanujan's congruences, they were just purely numerical congruences, perhaps, but they were really explained only by developing theory, right? You have to really develop a very elaborate uh, theoretical explanation for it. For example, Serre drew on the theory of elliptic representations, which was being newly minted at that time in the, the work of Grothendieck. And then Deline kind of proved the existence of these representations being a student of Grothendieck and using all the technology. Okay, uh, so anyway, I'm gonna skip all this slide. So the, the, what, what I want to summarize this slide by saying is that the way Serre and Surin Dyer proved uh, the, the kind of uh, studied the images of these representations associated with Delta function was by developing a very beautiful theory of mod L modular forms, right? So it's a very geometric theory and there, uh, it, is, it is exposited in a seminar Burbaki by Ser in, I think, the 1973 or it's certainly the early 70s. And somehow in that, via this model theory of modular forms, they, they could kind of classify what the images of the elliptic representation associated with delta is. And that, that way, they explained the congruence of Ramanujan. 
right? Anyway, so now I'm, I've, I've prepared far more than I can fit into the lecture. So let me skip this slide. I mean, there are various other congruences which also proved out to be proved to be very important for the delta function. Okay. So now, okay, now in fact, I'm, I'm, as for for lack of time, I'm going to in fact skip over uh, skip over these slides I've made. Okay, I wanted to explain the relation of Sayer's work to his conjectures. Right. So now let me just talk about it rather than. Uh, so Sayer actually so made these conjectures associated to the delta function. He conjectured that there exists a mod L Galois representation from the absolute Galois group of Q into GL2 of FL, which explained his congruences, right? And it is in this context that Sayer in 1973 in a letter to Tate uh, made a converse to his construction. So he was saying that, ah, okay, mod L, uh, I'm conjecturing that mod L Galois representation of certain sort into GL2 FL or GL2 FL bar, which were, in particular odd right somehow the one property he knew was that the determinant of complex conjugation right because complex conjugation remember is one element you can is one of the elements you can write down of the galois group of q uh, at least as a conjugacy class the determinant of that is minus one that is related to the fact that the space of modular forms is non-zero if and only if not if not, the non-zero implies the weight is even right the evenness even of evenness of the weight is a parity condition translates into a parity condition on the galois representation ser constructed or thought about. So he, in a, in a, in a paper, to, in a letter to Tate in 1973, Sayer uh, made, kind of had this leap of the imagination or whatever, made this kind of <laughs> conjecture that in fact, all the Galois representations, uh, which one can think about in the sense GL2 into G, two by two, G, into GL2 FL bar, which are odd and irreducible. The irreducibility also is not really important, but it, they, as long as they're odd, they should actually come from modular forms. Right, so somehow this was this, this is what is called Sayer's modularity conjecture. So he made this in the context of this work. So what I wanted to point out in the last five minutes is that say, the Ramanujan also certainly impacted was what the Ramanujan's congruences led to a line of development, which also led to Sayer formulating his conjecture, right? His so-called Sayer's modularity conjecture, which he made in some form in the 1973. Uh, he made it only in the so-called level one case where he was fixing the congruence subgroup to be SL2Z rather than some congruence subgroup thereof. And uh, and then again, just like when Ram, Ramanujan conjectured something model immediately proved some parts of his conjectures, Tate in a remarkable kind of uh, argument using elementary algebraic number theory more or less, proved Sayer's conjectures in a very particular case, right? He proved the Sayer's conjectures are L equal to two. So, uh, so I mean, in fact, Sayer, Tate wrote back to Sayer, Scattered, scattered set of things. Let me let me point out this very beautiful numerical fact about Tawel. Also, it's also a, people also study other congruence properties of Tawel. Right? Is Tawel congruent to zero mod L or is Tawel not congruent to zero mod L? Right? So some of this is a property also which uh, even Sayer had pointed out in his seminar DPP and uh, yeah all those kind of talks that it often happens. It seems to be that that Tawel is never congruent to zero mod L except for a very small set of primes L. Right, so I think when Sayer wrote his uh, paper, he probably knew only these these few primes, two, three, five, seven, at which Tawel was congruent to zero model, right? But actually, after that, people have found two thousand four hundred eleven is some prime for which Tau L is congruent to zero model, and then this frighteningly large prime, right, which I think is like seven billion something or the other, right? It's, it, that is also a prime at which Tau L is congruent to zero model. So these are called non-ordinary primes when L does not divide Tau L. These are called uh, sorry when L divides Tau L. These are called non-ordinary primes. And and when L does not divide tau L, these are called ordinary primes. And then somehow they have some significance in terms of the geometry and Galois representation. So for example, if, if there's a student listening to this, it's a, certainly an open question whether there are infinitely many ordinary primes for the tau function, right? Are there infinitely many primes L so that tau L is not congruent to zero model? Of course, one expects this to happen almost all the time, right? Certainly for a density one set of primes, but one doesn't even know if there are infinitely many such primes, right? Of course, by pure logic, if the there, there are two mutually exclusive properties, Tawel congruent to zero model, Tawel not congruent to zero model. At least one of these sets has to be infinite, but you don't know which one, right? Though the money is on the fact that Tawel not congruent to zero model is the dominant condition. Right? It should happen almost all the time. But, uh, and up to 10 billion, there are only one, two, three, four, five, six non-ordinary primes, right? Which is a, okay. So that's another feature of these Tau functions, right? And there's also another conjecture of lemma. Let me end. By okay, I was going to talk about Sayer's modularity conjecture, but and it's, it's relation to this, but I'm going to skip all that. Uh, also, it's, I mean, the, the, all these things influence a lot of mathematics. For example, Ribbit's, with a very famous work of Ken Ribbit from the 1970s, uh, 
to do with the theory of cyclotomic field, which was again influenced by this mod 691 congruence of Ramanujan. So what I want to point out, right? What is the, the takeaway message from this is that Ramanujan made these uh, conjectures in 1916 and they influenced a lot of mathematics, right? Including uh, Fermat's last theorem, as I'll explain now. The mod 691 uh, congruence of Ramanujan, okay, as a summary of my lecture, inspired Ser and Sunan Dyer in the 70s to create, invent the theory of mod P modular forms. Now in the 1970s, there was an intense study of the theory of mod P modular forms, right? Due to especially the work of beautiful work of Barry Mazur, it is very stunning paper called Modular Curves and the Eisenstein Ideal from the 1976 or something. Ken Ribbit, my advisor, Haruzo Hida, Andrew Wiles, right? They kind of uh, developed this magnificent theory uh, of, of congruences between modular forms. And alongside, Sayer also made this kind of uh, bold conjecture that, uh, that, the, that there should be in some sense an identity between certain kinds of gather representations and certain kinds of modular forms. Right? It's a converse to the construction yet conjecture in, in this DPP seminar. So, uh, so, so when Sayer made the conjectures, of course, they were completely inaccessible, right? There was no way one could even start thinking about them in some ways. But in 1987, to make precise the idea of Fry to deduce Fermat's last theorem from something much more structural in number theory called the shimura Taniyama conjecture, for Sayer formulated a more precise form of his conjecture, right? In a Duke paper in 1987. And... Uh, and, and he formulated a more precise form of his conjectures and pointed out, I think it was in fact a remark of Kolmes, perhaps that, uh, that his conjectures, though the, so these conjectures are, about mod, uh, are basically conjectures about mod P representations, right? But somehow, I mean, they do imply characteristic zero statements. For example, they imply the Shimura, Shimura Tanema conjecture. In fact, they imply modularity of certain kinds of motives, right? So somehow, though they are characteristic mod P conjectures, if you use these conjectures for infinitely many primes P, you can deduce characteristic zero statements, right? So somehow, uh, uh, okay, this uh, so says uh, for refined conjecture, which he made in 1980s, led to the work of Ken Ribbit and others that the qualitative form of says conjecture implies a refined form. So again, says conjecture in the original form seemed inaccessible, but people did a, people did a very lot of beautiful and kind of work uh, deducing these refined versions of says conjectures from the qualitative form. The qualitative form still remained beyond reach, right? But this work, even to go from qualitative to from re qualitative to refined form, is very deep. And uh, Ken Ribbit, for example, wrote this uh, very important paper in the published in 1919, Invention is Math 100, where, in, where using the latest, all the very deep arithmetic geometry, he deduced, uh, says, refined form from his qualitative form. And this is a paper in which he showed uh, that the Fermat's last, he made precise, uh, say, Fry's kind of idea that, uh, that Shimura Tanima implies Fermat. Right? And all this was stimulated by work on congruences between modular forms, right? which again goes back to Ramanujan's 1916 paper, at least in the sense it started off a journey. So uh, during, uh, so Wiles in 1994, right, invented this, uh, came, uh, proved, uh, proved from a Shimura Taniwa conjecture, the semi-stable case, uh, by inventing this very beautiful technique called modularity lifting, uh, which has given rise, uh, which has ever since been undergone intense development right, uh, for the last 25 years and has been one of the most powerful tools, an arithmetic tool, unlike the traditional Langlands program, which is perhaps more harmonic analysis and so on. This is a very arithmetic tool using congruences between modular forms to relate automorphic forms, Galois representations, and motifs. Right? So Shimura Tanima conjecture is one of the outstanding kind of uh, cases of the Langlands program one would like to prove, which of course predated Langlands. Uh, but the only known way to prove this conjecture is by using very arithmetic ideas, as introduced by Andrew Weitz right? and others. <laughs> So this conjecture of, uh, so I'm just giving you now a grab, kind of a bag of things which uh, I'm just mentioning names, okay? So the conjecture of web, web of relationships between automorphic forms, right? With analysis, geometry, and algebra. Automorphic forms, uh, Galois representations, and motifs, right? Algebra, algebraic varieties. Is the vision of Langlands and the arithmetic introdu methods introduced by Wiles have resulted in dramatic progress in the Langlands program using, using kind of a very fine integral theory of modular forms, right? These methods were, in a sense, a wholly unexpected source of progress from the point of view of the traditional Langlands program. Right? So some of yeah, these are methods are totally kind of quite different. Of course, they draw upon they, they, one would use some things which the traditional Langlands program produces, but uh, you build upon it in some very different way. So it is indeed very surprising that a very fine integral theory of modular forms, spurred by Ramanujan's congruence and then developed by work of Sayer, Sun, and Dyer. Uh, has proved such a powerful tool to attack some of the central conjectures in the Langlands program, like the Shimura Taniyama conjecture, which predates it. And the Langlands program, those conjectures make no formula, they make no reference to congruences between modular forms. 
right? But the amazing thing is that this very fine integral theory has a big impact on uh, casting zero classical statements, which uh, conjectures, which were totally inaccessible till Weil started. So also, for example, uh, in work I did uh, with, with my French colleague who unfortunately passed away a, a few years ago, Jean-Pierre Mathieu-Berger, and I proved Sayer's conjecture, this modularity conjecture, this converse uh, to Sayer's uh, construction of going from delta to a Galois representation. One wanted to reverse the direction, to go from a Galois representation to a modular form. And this was uh, proved by Mathieu-Berger and myself uh, in this period. Uh, the main ingredients uh, are the theory of congruences between modular forms and Wiles's modularity lifting techniques, right? So some of the main techniques, uh, the main technique is the modularity lifting technique of Wiles. In fact, the proof has a striking feature that it uses an induction on primes, right? I don't think that, I, I, I think at least people like Sarnak and so on told me that there, there are not many proofs where, where, which use an induction on primes, right? So this is one feature of this proof, which is kind of amusing that the proof uses an induction on primes. And, and what is the starting point of the induction? What is, induction always needs a starting point. The, the starting point of the induction is this proof of state of Sayers conjecture in the case L equal to two, in a very particular case. So that, so while you have the case for, you have the conjecture for L equal to two, in level one, then uh, on the other hand, then Sayer observed that the same argument of state works for L equal to three, right? So somehow this is our starting point. You get, you have the conjecture for two and three, and then you induct on the prime, right? Of course, how do you do the induction is a, is a different story. And in general, one, one can uh, think about Sayer's conjectures, right? Which I, which I claim have, are, are, are in the line of descent, I mean, are, are in a certain tradition, which uh, started with Ramanujan's 1916 paper. Uh, it's okay that he or Sayer himself thinks about it as some kind of Mott P. Langlands program, right? Uh, and this, uh, the, the, this Mott P. Langlands program, uh, Jean Pierre and uh, Mathieu Bejo and I have just proven one case of this pro conjecture of this program, which is the classical case as formulated by Sayer. This is just a starting point, right? Because you, there's no need to think about GL2, you can think about GL3, GLN, and there, there, are a, there is an entire world waiting to be explored and needs the subject is very demanding, I think. Uh, it needs a lot of work and, and it, it, it certainly has benefited from a lot of talent coming in and there's been a lot of work since Andrew Wiles uh, and the subject in a state of explosive development. So maybe I'll uh, end here, thanks. Thanks for a fantastic talk. Although this is a little quick, we would have liked to have maybe one or 20 minutes to see the other slides, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, another yeah. one hour and 20 minutes, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> some other time in the future, maybe yeah. some more details. Any questions? Yeah, I see There's one in the chat. <laughs> yeah, so the Shubhraji, he asked about the Prime 691. So as I said, yeah, 691 uh, also, in fact, uh, plays a role in Ken Ribbit's famous uh, proof of the converse to so-called Herbrand's theorem. Where, he, where the point is that if you look at Q zeta 691, right, the 691st cyclotomic field, if you look at the silo, if you look at the class group of that, Q zeta 691, and, uh, and sometimes all this is, of course, people had started studying cyclotomic fields uh, partly inspired by Fermat's last theorem, right? Kumar in the 19th century, he made a very deep study of uh, the class groups of cyclotomic fields and came up with these wonderful class number formulas in terms of special values of L functions. And uh, so there, there was this tradition which was coming from Fermat's last theorem, perhaps, study of Fermat's last theorem. And he had identified Kumar in the 19th century, this condition of being regular, right? He calls the prime P regular if P does not divide uh, the order of the class group of Q zeta P, right? So some of those, and he had, he had observed, I think, that uh, oh, he had proved that uh, if, pri if P is regular, then perhaps he can prove Fermat's uh, last theorem for that exponent P. Right, so there was, a, there was this tradition of a regular and irregular primes, and it turns out that 691 is an irregular prime, as asked by Shubhraji. Yeah. So 691 yeah. does, divide, does divide the class group, the order of the class group of Q zeta 691. On the other hand, there was this sort of more refined uh, kind of things you could think about, which were again thought about by Kumar, I think, perhaps, that you look at, you, know, you don't just look at the class group, right? but you look at it as a module or the action of the Galois group of Q zeta 691 over Q, which is 6, Z mod 691 star. And then you can decompose the class group into eigenspaces for this action. And then you can ask which eigenspace is non-trivial, right? So this was the direct, this was the work which Ken Ribbit uh, proved, I mean, her brand in some one, one direction and Ken Ribbit in the other direction, using theory of modular forms. Again, 
says DPP paper, right? This Dela, Delange piece of part two seminar paper actually makes a remark about this and suggests that this is something worth thinking about. And, uh, and uh, that the theory of modular form and the, and the Ramnujan congruence might have some impact or might have some bearing or even on structure of class groups. And then Ken Ribbit followed this up in the 1976 or something. In a short paper in invention is 10 pages, right? He proves this. Again, that paper has been very influential. It led to hundreds of pages uh, of mathematics. Mesa Wiles developed Ken Ribbit's ideas to prove the so-called main conjecture of Iwasa theory, yeah. which is again a third paper, which is again the main tool is theory of congruences between modular forms. And yeah, so it is related to such things. Yeah. In fact, Andrew Wiles, I mean, he was, uh, he, I mean, he has a, there's this, of course, story that he has a 10 year old boy. He was interested, he had seen the statement of Fermat's last theorem and wanted to think about it and bided his time, right? Till, till he thought that mathematics was in a place so that you could actually think about it in a sensible way. And throughout his career, then, I mean, till, till he started thinking about Fermat's last theorem, he thought about congruences between modular forms and he thought about uh, the main conjectures of Yuvasava theory and all what he thought influenced his attack on Fermat's last year. Yeah. And he drew upon his lifetime of, of dedication to thinking about congruences and their relation to arithmetic. To, uh... And in fact, he was very inspired by Hida's work. Hida in the, uh, Hida in the 1980s, 19, early 1980s, introduced a sort of totally different, uh, beautiful kind of idea of deforming the modular forms. And that was very influential on uh, Wise's work. And now the theory of Euler systems has generalized uh, all these concepts uh, more, right? Yeah, but that's, I think, is in a different way. I mean, it doesn't really, I mean, of course, one can combine, but Euler system yeah, yeah. in some sense is good at proving upper bounds, modular forms is good at proving lower bounds yeah. on, okay. on, on sizes of arithmetic yeah. objects like class. Yeah. Thank you. So in fact, the I, for example, I have, by temperament, by, by temperament, I'm not someone who's naturally drawn to thinking about Diffentine equations, but uh, as a, like Fermat's last theorem, but because I, when I studied in 19, between 1990 and 95 uh, at Caltech and my, actually my advisor was Hida at UCLA. Uh, the fact that uh, Ken Ribbit had proven this thing that Shimura Tanima implies Fermat, it was kind of hot, that, that, it was a kind of hot subject. And I spent years looking at Ken Ribbit's paper without understanding much. Right, but uh, I, I kind of, uh, some of that has proved useful to me to look at this paper over a bit. I took, I, I studied for a couple of years without only gradually getting little bits and pieces from here and there. But uh, yeah, so Fermat's last time has influenced my career as well, though I'm not someone who thinks about Diffentine equations at all. But the fact that it was this famous thing and Ken Ribbit had proven this famous theorem, I decided to, and I'm drawn to studying things which are perhaps in the news, right? So I, st I studied Ken Ribbit's paper. And so it, it was a big influence on me, on my, on my career studying. And after I was a student of Hida, so that also influenced, uh, you know, the direction I went in. And I studied congruences between modular forms, right, starting with my thesis. So I had a question if... Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, um, so you mentioned... Yeah, Rajiv, okay. Uh, hi, right. uh, yeah, I think we met. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, the uh, you mentioned these two levels of abstraction. The first one in terms of these Hecke operators that explain the initial parts of the Ramanujan conjecture, and then later this uh, relation to Galois representation. But I was wondering whether what role the Hecke operators play in this Galois representation, and uh, in, in that. Uh, avatar or yeah. that, uh, form. Yeah. So I think the, for example, the, I mean, the, this Galois representations, uh, the Frobenius set P is connected with the P Hecke operator. So you can think of the, the Hecke okay. operator as a correspondence, and then Frobenius yeah. also is some sort of map of algebraic variety. So there's a relation between the P Hecke correspondence and the Frobenius map. Well, P, the P Hecke correspondence, then you reduce it mod P. It is related to, so, so this is a so-called very famous eichler shimura congruence relation, which then was, has been gen generalized, where which relates the p Hecke operator mod P to the Frobenius map. And that is the thing which allows you to relate the Eladic Galois representation locally at P, which is then captured mm -hmm. by the information of the Frobenius, trace of Frobenius at P to the eigenvalue of the p Hecke operator. Of the, Actually, which is yeah. tau. And also the Hecke operators produce endomorphisms of, uh, of uh, 
they, they produce endomorphs, endomorphs as cohomology of, for example, the modular curves, or, and they allow you to cut out motifs. Also, they have this thing of they cut out the space on which which affords the Galois representation. You can use the Hecke operators to to kind of decompose decompose certain things into it's pieces. Like a pro then, projection. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um. Of course, it's a very law, yeah. So Eichler Shimura kind of, Eichler in fact wrote a paper in the 1950s uh, in some in German, but uh, he just looks at all this just in the case X011, right? So the X011 turns out to be a modular curve and that, that, that is where he observed this Eichler congruence relation. And then it's the Shimura who used the theory of Hecke operators to somehow generalize his construction to modular from the higher level, They're not just X0 level, but X0N or X1N. And that, that is where he used Hecke operators to cut out pieces of the Jacobian of X1N, which would then afford this, uh, these Galois two dimensional Galois representation. And um, <clears throat> you didn't probably uh, ha have the time to touch on it, but I guess people generalize to GLNs uh, as well. Right? I mean, there are analogous statements for higher automorphic forms and so on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, and there are analogs of Hecke operators there in a similar... Mm. Yes, yes. Yeah, the Langlands program, of course, is a very vast general program which considers all reductive groups and... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, and yeah. So, but much of this, so these Serre conjectures, they, 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 there's some form of them for higher uh, automorphic... Yes, yeah. yeah. And, but of course, the, the interesting thing is that though now we proved this conjecture 15 uh, 10, 10, 12 years ago, that the only case of Serre conjecture, type conjecture, which is known, is the yeah, classical case, which is, which, is, which is the one we proved. One would think that now there might, one, one, one should be able to prove more cases, but it is very difficult. I mean, it's technically, I mean, though even though you might have a strategy, the technicality, it's like, I don't know, it's, there, there are a lot of singularities you, are, you encounter in the proof, and technically there's a lot of work which one has to do to overcome these problems. There has been a lot of development of the wise techniques. So uh, people have attacked, uh, have attacked uh, sort of higher dimensional GABA representation, but the Serre conjecture part of it has proved to be rather difficult to generalize. So people have, I mean, there's this famous 10 author, so called, so called 10 author paper. Number theorists nowadays have started hunting in packs, unlike earlier when people used to write solo papers nowadays. People kind of so there's this very famous ten author paper where, uh, or rather, it's a well-known ten author paper where uh, perhaps that represents in some form the latest in the wild type techniques where they do prove uh, automorphy of uh, Gal Eladic Galois representations and but yeah but so then the technology has developed a great deal uh, for for general groups. But uh, still, the, the Serre conjecture type thing has not been generalized. We want, we want exact results. Serre conjecture, in some sense, are exact results. But what people generalize is the so-called, what they call potential version of Serre conjecture, where you don't get it on the nose, but up to some sort of unspecified base error term, but base change. That thing is perhaps more robust, and uh, it has been generalized, but uh, Serre conjecture itself, I think, is... But it's, it's, it's pretty amazing that these wise techniques, which are very arithmetic and so on, they are the, really the source, I would think, of the greatest progress uh, in the Langlands program in terms of this direction of going from, from a geometric object to an automorphic form or from a Galois representation to an automorphic form. The other direction, there are more standard methods, uh, which are part of the traditional Langlands program, which go from an automorphic form to a Galois representation. Mm -hmm. I mean, though they are certainly very beautiful, very powerful, very important. But they somehow uh, the success in going the other direction has been more from the, the arithmetic, from the yeah from. Uh, sorry, I maybe maybe I lost. Is my internet going bad? I don't know. No, no, it's fine. No, 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 it's fine. Okay, okay. Uh, it says on my my end that the internet connection is unstable. Any any further questions? Is it, are you, am I am I visible? I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Hey, there was no problem with your audio. Okay, okay. Questions? More questions? Comments? So if there are no more questions, maybe we'll thank Chandrasekhar Khare again for a great talk and an excellent session. Thank you. Thank you. And hopefully a longer interaction, maybe physically in the future sometime. <laughs> For you to come here and conduct something. And I think that will be a really something that we look forward to.
of see you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. See so. you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Bye.